Welcome to the WWE Podcast. Your place for the most passionate wrestling analysis on the web. Just turn Roman heel. What is WWE waiting for? When other wrestling podcasts put you to sleep, you can count on the WWE Podcast to keep you engaged and asking for more. I've been watching wrestling for over 20 years, and that was one of the best matches I've ever seen. This is unlike any other wrestling analysis. So without any further delay, let's get the show started right now. Welcome to the WWE Podcast, guys. Thank you for joining me on this uh, Sunday, September 22nd, 2019 and I'm back, back in the saddle for a normal week of uh, the show, and uh, it's going to be, I think, a lot of fun this week as we creep closer to the uh, Clash of Champions pay-per-view, and as we um, as we get closer and closer to AEW and their debut on uh, TNT called Dynamite, so that's going to be, I think, a the, the, probably the talk of the fall season is this AEW and NXT uh, rivalry. Although if you read or watch Triple H's interview that he's recently done, um, I don't think he believes the same thing that it's a war. Uh, a lot of people are trying to compare AEW and NXT on Wednesday nights to the Monday Night Wars between WWF and WCW at the time. And while I understand his um, <clears throat> his logic and understanding that AEW is not truly in war with WWE, they are still competition. They are in competition. And uh, WWE may view AEW as, quote, the pissant company, but I think they should be very careful and not rest on their laurels to uh, just assume that AEW is going to be a, an organization that folds within a couple of years. I think they need to really take note that this is a company that is backed by a billionaire, right? So uh, the owner of the Jacksonville Jaguars. So, but speaking, quick note of football, my Giants won a game. I didn't, I didn't misspeak. The New York Giants won a football game. I, I don't know how it happened. I, 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 I'm still looking into exactly how this happened, um, but it, it did indeed happen. The impossible has happened. The Giants won a football game. So, they're they're one and two in the uh, their illustrious uh, last few years of uh, football and um, so anyway moving on to uh, just a couple of other other notes here today we're going to talk about Kane we're going to talk to you guys I'm going to talk to you guys about Kane and his return in 2000 that I absolutely loved uh, one that I think is overlooked it didn't even make WWE's top ten returns of Kane list which befuddles me to me this should have been in the top three and you can make a case for number one I don't know if they overlooked it forgot about it but it was a massive pop and we're gonna get to that of course you guys know you guys know that I love to give you audio and I think it really is a segment that is uh or a a piece of WWE history that is worth looking at this is a time when Stone Cold Steve Austin was no longer with the company because of his neck injury out for eight months. So Kane and the rest of the the crew really had to to guide the ship and uh, put the company on their back. And Kane certainly, I think, is one of the most overlooked talents. I shouldn't say overlooked. Underutilized talents in a uh, genre of mag- mega stars in the uh, Attitude Era. Maybe that's perhaps why he never got the true run that he deserved with the belt. Maybe that's the case. Maybe that's why they never really allowed Kane to, to take the ball and truly run with it. Um, with the Undertaker, Triple H, Big Show, Rock, Austin, the big, you know, those top, top tier guys never really gave Kane, a guy like Kane, who if his character was debuted now would be the biggest star in the company, never really gave him a chance to run. So um, we're going to look at that. Uh, Kane is one of my favorites of all time on my top three list. I love Kane so much as a character um, up until he demasked in uh, 2004, I want to say 2003, 2004. Um, and then choke slammed RVD turned quasi heel, but people loved him. There's 
a lot of mixed feelings I have about demasking Kane because you can't go back, right? You can't put, as they say, put the milk back in the udder. Like once it's done, it's done. And they, I don't think, capitalized correctly on Kane demasking. However, this is not what the, this show is particularly about. So we're going to get to the return in 2000 when Kane came in and destroyed Degeneration X, which was was a heel faction at the time. So we're going to get to that, of course, in just a minute. But first, guys, again, I just want to set the table. This is the WWE Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, a couple new notes on the show here. So you will notice that we now have a new logo, um, a new logo everywhere. So that is uh, just something that you may pick up on, or maybe you didn't. But... I think it's uh, it's a good idea to kind of freshen up the show every once in a while. So we have a new logo, um, and I'm I, I think it's I think it's good. It catches your eye. It may not be you know like looking like the rest of the wrestling shows out there, but I think it's uh, eye catching, and uh, I think it's pretty pleasing to the eye. I'll be honest. I, I like it. Hopefully you guys too. So check it out. You can find it anywhere that uh, you have your podcast. It should refresh soon. If you don't have it refreshed in your feed, um, just search me out on any podcast app you have and click subscribe and you can get yourself into the fold here. And also uh, we'll be doing four shows a week this week, hopefully five with an NXT podcast. And uh, we'll be doing tomorrow or excuse me, Tuesday with raw Wednesday with SmackDown Thursday with me, my co-host joining me as we discuss this, the entire week in WWE, you guys know the routine. So really excited. Really excited to be uh, back in the saddle, back in the normal swing of things. Um, I just as a on a personal note, I am in the process of moving from my home, um, and so I'll again. This is uh, this shouldn't affect the shows. So, uh, but just as a personal note, if indeed it does, of course I will let you guys know. But I don't anticipate that happening. Um, as moving is just a pain in the backside. Anybody that has ever moved, which is probably ninety nine point nine percent of you, it is. Um, it, it's no fun, right? Like, I mean, it's especially when you're selling a house or buying a house. Uh, there's 14 layers of things you have to go through. So anyway, you guys don't need to know about that stuff. You don't care about that stuff. You guys care about WWE. And um, we're going to talk about that in, in a minute. But uh, one last note, and we're going to get right into the audio because I lo- this audio gives me chills is there is a video stream now. You guys can view me live on YouTube and it's on a video stream that is only available to Patreon members. So you head on over patreon.com slash WWE podcast and you can uh, get yourself into the viewing party of this show being recorded live. Um, And so just so you know, and also not just live streams, but you can also uh, check out videos that'll be able to upload there. And I, I think I figured out a way to do it. <laughs> I know that I was I went live with it last week. It was a bit of a, a fumble, if you will. I, I booted it, and uh, it it's didn't exactly work out the way I wanted. But I think I've got it under control now. It's um, it's something that is not as straightforward as I thought it would be, but I think I've got it under wraps. And hopefully you guys enjoy it. But it's only available on patreon.com slash WWE podcast. And so you can get yourself in there and check this out and also get every ad, every show ad free. So there's lots of cool bonuses in there. And hopefully you guys enjoy it. Again, only available on Patreon. All right. Well, guys, um, let's let's jump into the audio here. And those of you that are uh, watching me right now, you know, see me scouring through my uh, my phone as I pull this up, YouTube just seems to be the quickest. I mean, I could go through the WWE Network, but uh, you know, 99% of the clips I show you guys are from the uh, are from YouTube. Just like you know, everything else we do in our life, right? I mean, you YouTube everything, everything in the world. God, the amount of things I YouTube are just embarrassing. Like, it's simple house projects, like it's simple stuff. It's, it's just it's crazy. All right, well, let's get to this audio. So, a little bit of a a setup here, a little setting the table as to what's going on here. <clears throat> This took place on February 7th, 2000, and Kane returned with Paul Bearer. It was a tag match with Triple H and uh, Rikishi and um, the New Age Outlaws against uh, Mick Foley, The Rock, Chris Benoit, and um, Scotty Tuhati, it looks like. Yeah, I think it, no, it's Chris Jericho. So just check this out, guys. Um, 
I'll let the audio speak for itself. I'll stop talking. Here we go. Kane returns there, and it was actually I'm, I'm mistaken as to the tag match. It it um it had the Radicals, which was Dean Malenko, Perry Saturn, Chris Benoit, teaming with DX, the Road Dog, uh, Jesse James, Badass Billy Gunn, Triple H, uh, so X Pac. I mean, so it was quite a uh, amount. Of, it was quite the amount of heels that were fed to Kane here, and it was. Oh my gosh! Just just listen to this with your headphones on. I mean, listen to the reaction. I don't know if it was captured here. I, I you know put my iPhone through my my mic here, and I hope you guys were able to catch a little bit of that. But if you want a better audio quality type of listen to that, I think it's worth listening to. And that right there was the essence of what Kane was. Kane was this guy that was at the time kind of a lost soul. And didn't have direction and um, had for so long been a heel. And having him return to destroy the top heel faction in WWE was just perfect. It was perfect. And this is what you expect when Raw ends. And that's the explosion that you expect when Raw ends, or at least... The one that I'm still not used to not having uh, this day and age. And, you know, sometimes we get it. Sometimes we don't. But this is what happened on a weekly basis in the Raw, in the Attitude Era. It was just expected. It was awesome. Um, And certainly with Stone Cold Steve Austin out on injury, the guys had to, 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 um, you know, toe toe the line here. And they certainly did. And there was more than enough star power to make up for what was their biggest star at the time of Stone Cold Steve Austin is still the biggest star of all time. But they filled the hole pretty damn well. And having Kane come out there, I mean, this to me, I mean, looking back, of course, was the the time when they should have used it as a launching point for them to launch Kane into the title picture and have him get a run with the belt. It just never seemed to manifest Never. I know Kane has won the championship twice. I understand that, okay? I know that he won in, what, 2010, 2011. I understand he won the world championship. I also understand that he beat Stone Cold in uh, the 1998 King of the Ring inside the cell, even though it wasn't a Hell in a Cell match. It was the first blood match. I understand all of that. But Kane never truly got a, a real legitimate run as the top guy seeing the potential of Kane seeing what he could be and do. And I I don't know why we never truly got that. Kane was 
not often hurt. He was reliable as hell from everybody that I've ever heard talk about Kane. He has never been an issue in the locker room. He has always been the most, he, he was as Triple H described him, the constant. He was always there, a team player. Uh, and that he was mega over. He could be face or heel and be one, be that either way and do a great job at it. Kane was that guy. And Kane was, I don't know, understand, I don't know why there was never truly a run given to him. As I said, maybe it was because there was just so much other really, really t- uh, great talent and even more over talent, such as The Undertaker. He always, Kane always stood in the shadow of The Undertaker. Always to this day. He still stands in the shadow of The Undertaker, never truly on equal footing. Never. And that's okay because The Undertaker is deemed to be one of the greatest, and you can make an argument for, the greatest of all time. So is it fair to compare it to The Undertaker? No, but the problem is that you have him as the uh, the storyline brother of Kane, or of The Undertaker, and they were the brothers of destruction for quite some time. There's a lot there, and when you have him side by side with Taker, it just de- le- deems itself. I can't speak tonight, guys. I apologize. I'm just. It's Sunday now. I'm getting ready for the work week. Um, it just lends itself to a, 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 a an automatic comparison of Undertaker to Kane, and then maybe that's why Kane has always stood in the shadow of Undertaker. But at the same time, would Kane have been as big of a star as he is today? If he had not been associated with The Undertaker and been the, quote, brother of The Undertaker. That storyline was one of the best ever told. Ever. And I know I went over this in a previous show of Wrestling Nostalgia when I went through uh, The Undertaker and Kane at WrestleMania 14. When it took three tombstones to beat Kane. And he kicked out at three and a half. Love that, by the way. I don't think that's done enough. When you kick out just after the three count. I don't think that's done enough. It's small, but I think it's a big deal. But um, backtrack into what I was talking about. That storyline was one of the best ever told of a two brothers, one lost, that returned to WWE um, in vengeance of what he believes The Undertaker did, and that's burn the funeral home, kill their parents, and brutally maim Kane, which is why he wears a mask. Uh, and, and so Undertaker refuses to fight back. Refuses, 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 and Kane played the, the played the nasty heel, played the the big bully, and you waited for the Undertaker to basically grow a set and say no, fight back, don't let him beat you down, and it was easy to get behind the Undertaker. Kane inside the ring, not just during that match, but throughout his whole career, has been extremely solid, extremely solid, very never quite ever a five star match. I will say that. Kane never, but he's not built for a five star match. And furthermore, in the 2019 definition of what a five star match is, we all think of five star matches as this is awesome chance. We think of five star matches as ricochet type matches and the NXT style of professional wrestling. That's un, that's what it has evolved to of the really what a definition of a five star match is, and. I, for better or worse, that's what it is. It's not my cup of tea per se because I think the lack of selling in this day and age is a huge problem and massive disconnect for me to get emotionally invested in a match. But it is what it is. And 2019's version of what great matches are are those are those crazy moves, double, triple, reverse, you know, finishes and kickouts of finishes, and that's just what it is today. And back in, you know, 1999 to 2003 or so, and really up to 2007 before the uh, Attitude Era officially, or or really the PG Era began in 2008, um, this, there was a Ruthless Aggression Era, I know, after the Attitude Era. But my my point is that the fact that Kane never put on, quote, five-star matches and still was able to accomplish what he did as a character and easily a first band hall of fame first ballot hall of famer this guy it's almost criminal that he never got a true run with the belt and and to see what he could have been at the very very top uh you know i I just think it did a bit of a disservice to him and what's even crazier is i'm talking about what happened in 1999 2000 
Today is 2019. And look at what happened in this past week on Raw. Just think about that. Think about that. Kane was on Monday Night Raw. And that, it's just insanity. It's insanity. It's awesome. And it's, but it's insanity. Um, and so when you look at this, 20 years later, Kane is still on Monday Night Raw. I understand on a very, very limited basis. And he would never be the focal point of WWE again. And nor should he be. And I'm not advocating for that. That's not what I'm saying. My point is that the longevity of this guy and the fact that you know, the crowd did react to him pretty positively on Monday night was a testament to his impact and body of work over the, his 25-year career in WWE as Kane, not Glenn Jacobs, Kane, when he debuted in 97. So we're coming up on 22 years that he has been officially Kane and many iterations of Kane. We went through the initial debut of Kane when he was an absolute freak of nature, massive, you know, could take down Undertaker. N- nobody could uh, even, even, on a, I remember when, um, on Monday Night Raw after Kane debuted, they had Mosh and Thrasher, the headbangers, and I think it was a handicap match with him. They used a boombox to shatter off Kane's head, and it didn't even phase him. That's when I said, oh, my God, because I've never seen anything like that before. And it really made an impact on me and go, this guy's a a complete monster. Like, what is happening? And I was legitimately, you you know, like kind of freaked out. Of course, look, it was 1998, 1997. I was 12 or 13 years old. You got to remember that too. So this guy made a huge impact upon his debut. Huge, huge. He felt different, looked different. He wore a mask and was playing the heel during the Undertaker run and then came back as a baby face in 2000 to destroy D-Generation X after uh, Tori had really give him, gave him the shaft, if you will, and uh, ended up cheating on him with X-Pac. So there's a lot here, and I'm going to also touch on the Tory incident, which, my God, could you imagine happening today? Kane, Tombstone, Tory on the next SmackDown, which was the next show. Because remember, this was on Thursday night when SmackDown Live... It wasn't even SmackDown Live. When SmackDown was... Um, when, when SmackDown Air was a Thursday, so... I'm going to get to that audio in just a minute, too. But um, my point being, when he re-debuted in 2000, he was off TV for weeks and weeks. And nobody expected him to come back. I didn't expect him to come back in that spot. You knew Stone Cold was out with an injury. So you couldn't have hit, you know the glass break and everybody gets stunners and the crowd goes crazy and we get a bunch of beer. So you knew that was off the table. You knew The Rock was off the table to come save the day because he was already in as part of the match and got beat down by the New Age Outlaws with lead pipes. So who the hell was out there to save the day? Who was there? Well, we got our answer. Kane, and with Paul Bearer, I don't think we sing the praises of Paul Bearer enough. Uh, I know he's no longer with us, but he was just so brilliant. You look back to when he was even aligned with The Undertaker. And his promos that he would cut on uh, Mankind when he when The Undertaker and Mankind were in a program, the things he would say, his obnoxiousness, he was a little bit Paul Heyman, a little bit Bobby Heenan, uh, but he had his own style and he was just obnoxious. The faces he would make were hilarious, but also just wanted someone to punch him in the face. There was just so, so much about Paul Bearer that I don't think or know if The Undertaker would be The Undertaker without Paul Bearer. That's a huge statement, I understand. Undertaker is a hell of a talent and could have probably performed on his own and you know maybe didn't need a manager, but Paul Bearer, the urn, his look, um, his voice, the yeah. All of that like, was just brilliant, absolutely brilliant on the part of Paul Heyman or Paul, um, Paul Bearer, rather. And it was, it was awesome. I, I even remember sharing a little bit of a memory here with you. WrestleMania 20, when Kane and Undertaker fought for the second time at WrestleMania, and you had Kane 
who was unmasked at that time. And you had Undertaker, who was the American badass, however, was buried by Kane and then turned to the dark side. Thank God. I think we're all waiting for him to just go back to the dead man. And when Kane or when Undertaker came out, Paul Heyman. God, I don't know why I keep saying Paul Heyman. I'm not used to saying Paul Bearer. Maybe that's why. Paul Bearer came out. That was the very first voice you heard was him saying yes. And I'm not going to imitate it because it would come off awful. But you guys know what I'm thinking, right? When Paul Bearer does his yes, it's uh, it's just it's one of the most recognizable voices of any manager or performer, wrestler ever. Uh, He had a very unique voice and just was such a great counterpart to The Undertaker or Kane. I know he flip-flopped back and forth several times. Um, So anyway, guys, I'd really, really recommend you check this clip out. Just search Kane Returns 2000 and you'll see see it come up. It's a a very well-done segment. Um, it, it It set the table up perfectly for a massive babyface return. And of course, with Stone Cold out, he had there had to be a um, a a big baby face to come out there and to, to fill the gap. So, um, all right. Well, I am now. If you guys bear with me just a minute here, I am looking for Kane Tombstone's story. Well, look at that. It's the very first search result. So, um, I'm going to play this for you guys. And this was, of course. Three days later at the SmackDown, um, SmackDown taping. So let me give you guys a little bit of uh, audio. Here we go. So that was uh, that was Kane tombstoning Tori again. A beautiful moment, beautiful moment. Um, it was it, it was a moment that I don't think we'll ever see again. Um, I don't think we'll ever see it again because WWE is PG. WWE is PG, and I don't think we're going back. Uh, and you would never ever see this in WWE's PG program. In, in 2019, it's just it's just not going to happen. Um, and again, it it was uh, you know when you listen to the audience, you, know, you talk about people who are saying, "Well, oh well, it, nobody wants to see that." People, you know, you're just being you know a sexist pig or well, whatever, whatever the, the argument may be. Yet you hear the reaction for the crowd clamoring to see Kane choke slam and tombstone Tory, who did. You know, did what she did and cheated on her with cheated on him with X Pac, right? Um, and it was something that you have to keep in mind. This was this was warranted by Kane. Kane wasn't going out, and Kane 
wasn't just deciding to tombstone a woman to tombstone a woman, right? That's not the case here. Cain had a reason. Just as in 2019, if a man had a reason to tombstone a, um, a woman because of whatever she did, maybe he's getting retribution. Or look at Nia Jax. Look at Nia Jax and see what she did to you know, enter the Men's Royal Rumble, and she ends up getting exactly what she deserved. So I'm surprised that they actually did that. I was really surprised that they actually went through with that. And um, I'm just glad. I know I'm going way off topic with Nia Jax, but uh, that still is something I really, really don't agree with uh, as far as um, having a woman enter a men's Royal Rumble. But uh, that's neither here nor, here nor there. This is uh, getting way off track. So uh, getting back on track, I just want to um, also touch on some of the news as, as I always do in my wrestling nostalgia segments in the uh, in the wrestling news wire, and reportedly Vince McMahon loved the NXT show on Wednesday night, loved it, which is amazing considering that that is not his brand of wrestling these days, brand of um, I guess production. Interesting that he loved the NXT so damn much that um, yet he's producing a show every week, twice a week, that is that does not have those traits in NXT and what makes NXT great. NXT, what makes NXT great is the ability and of the performers in the ring to tell a story in the ring. There's very little backstage garbage. It's straightforward and it's with athletes that are there to win. To win. All the you know, you, you hear so many times that it's about making history. How many times in the women's evolution did we hear uh, it's history? Let's make history. How about winning the match? That's why you're here, right? You're here to win. You're an athlete. At least that's what you're telling us. And I think that that is what is making NXT work is, yes, the athleticism, of course. But also, it's the ability of the performers to bring you into matches even if you don't know the full story you just clicked on the channel and boom you're already you're invested because they're bringing you in so that is um at least that's my take so here is some other news coming out here i wanted to touch on um sean michaels reveals why he didn't wrestle dolph ziggler so that's interesting. I mean, I, I don't see why Sean wouldn't would have come out of retirement, full retirement to do that. Um, so here's what uh, Sean Michael said about his return at Crown Jewel. I guess it was because it was a totally different situation. Again, this is all in quotes. At that point in the match, it was special. It was a special request for my boss. And again, I guess I always felt that if I'm not doing WrestleMania, that was one. That was the one that anybody, I guess, if I was going to come back, um, was going to come back to. Uh, I just feel like if you are in a tag match, it's not the same thing. I know it's not right to say it. I don't mean it in a negative way. But to me, it just felt like a house show that somebody asked you to make. And I went ahead and did it in a tag match and it, and got it over with. Um. And here, okay, so that's about Crown Jewel that, you know, WWE would like to strike from their record. On what he said about Ziggler, I never know when the phone call is going to come and I'm going to jump off a plane or jump on a plane, excuse me. Uh, I was just sort of doing what I was asked to do. If nothing else, with all these years later, after 30, I'm a pretty good employee. I just do what I'm told, so to speak. It was f fun to do, but there was absolutely no thought of me and Dolph or anything like that. It was always going to be Bill Goldberg, but perhaps they needed somebody in to light the fuse for Dolph in that respect. And I was the guy to do it as best as I could. So there really was no ever, apparently, according to Sean, no true plans to ever have Sean versus Ziggler. Although I think that could be a really, really good match. And yes, there have been many comparisons of Dolph made to, to Sean over the years. And you know, maybe that's not fair to make 
um, you know, because I don't think that in, in, in retrospect, you would want to compare Dolph to Ziggler because, well, it's Sean freaking Michaels, right? It's Sean Michaels. And it's, it's a guy that is a once in a lifetime talent. It's a guy that is one of, if not the greatest of all time, stone cold, has said that Ric Flair and Shawn Michaels are his top two. Ric Flair has said Shawn Michaels is his favorite of all time. Ric Flair says has said that. And so I believe it. Shawn Michaels is one of the best in-ring performers of all time. And so I'm fine with him never facing Dolph. Um, I don't think he needs. I think he just should stay retired, to be totally honest. I don't mind some sweet chin music, but I don't need Shawn coming out of retirement. Um, and I certainly don't need him to shave his head. That was probably the biggest sin of all of this. It was just terrible. Just terrible. Um, so also it appears that Brock Lesnar is confirmed for more WWE appearances and, uh, they've begun advertising him for several more dates in the coming weeks and he's going to get a bigger presence on television. He's currently advertised for the October 11th draft that's going to take place. Um, and at Vegas in Vegas, that's going to be there. And the, t- uh, October 25th edition of SmackDown live in Kansas city, Missouri. So, Certainly, it appears that WWE is shelling out the cash to get Lesnar on planes to get away from his farm and his secluded nature to put him on television to grab the biggest audience that they possibly can. They are leaning clearly heavily on Brock Lesnar to bring in the big ratings. And um, I would pretty much bet the house at this point that Brock Lesnar is going to be drafted to SmackDown Live. It's it's almost a fait accompli. I mean, it, I think it is exactly... The right move, though, I, even if it is transparently obvious, that's fine. I think that is the, it's the right thing to do. I think it's the right thing to do to have Brock Lesnar on SmackDown Live. I've mentioned this several times before. If you guys want to listen to my previous shows, I won't go into too much depth other than it, it would be a nice change for Brock. New fresh start, new faces, new opponents, new belt to go after, plus his beard and his hair that he's growing out on top. All of that, you wrap it all together, and it's a great fresh start for Brock. And... It um, for you, Kofi Kingston fans out there, it gives Kofi Kingston a new opponent to 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 uh, dance with. Even if he's going to lose, I think it's going to be a credible loss. It's going to be Kofi going down with guns blazing, and I think that is for you, Kofi lovers out there. I'm not one of them as far as him being WWE champion. And I mean, that, let me just be clear on that. I've made that clear many, many, many times. Big Kofi fan, just not as WWE champion. That it would be a guns going down with the ship, going down with guns blazing in in that kind of environment. So um, that is, I think, where we're at. Um, I know this this is a, a bit of a short show, but again, guys, thank you so much for joining me. I'll be back t- uh, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night. As always, this has been a blast, guys. Thank you so much for listening. As always, I'll talk to you next time.